We're going to get started here in a minute. I want to make sure that everyone can see me. And then we will get started by 4.30. going to get started here in a minute. I want to make sure that everyone can see me. And then we will get started by All right, we're going to jump in now, and hopefully everyone can hear me. There are going to be a chat box on your YouTube channel and on Google Hangouts uh, to the right of your computer screen where you can ask me any questions. Hi, Dana. Good to see you. I'm glad you can see me. Uh, hopefully you can hear me too as well. Kim, I appreciate it. Uh, you know I love District 58, so <laughs> I'm glad I'm part of this and that y'all are setting it up uh, today. I wanted to share a story with you before we get started. So I'm doing this really big keynote, and I bring my mom along with me because she hasn't heard me speak before. So I go, and uh, I'm about to meet with my meeting planner. I go about two minutes away to meet this meeting planner. I'm opening my hotel door, and my mom goes, hey, baby, can you wait real quick? And I said, no, mom, I got to go meet this meeting planner. Can it wait? And she goes, no, 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 please, I want to come with you, but can I make a call real quick? And I said, no, mom, we got to go. Uh, and she goes, please, 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 can I make this call? And I said, all right, fine. So she makes the call, comes back out, and she's all smiling and giddy. And I'm like, mom, what was so important? Why did you have to make that call? And she said, oh, I had to call Dora. Dora is her best friend. And she said, I, I had to call Dora, and I had to brag about you, baby. And I was like, okay, that's very nice, mom. Thank you. What did you have to brag about? She said, I was bragging about how you're speaking all over the place and how you're twerking all the time. And I was like, wait, what did you say, mom? And she goes, yeah, I was telling everybody how you're twerking all the time. And I go, mom, st stop saying that word. It's making me super uncomfortable. What do you think that word means? And she goes, well, babe, it's that thing you're always doing on your phone with the 140 characteristics and that cute little blue bird. And I go, mom, do you mean tweeting? Do you mean I tweet all the time? And she goes, well, I guess. What's the difference? A big difference, mom. A really, really big difference. Uh, so I have no idea how many of my friends' moms think I twerk for a living. Um, that is not what I do. I speak for a living. Um, and I share that story with you because it's a reminder of what we're going to talk about today. And it's the little things that make a big difference in everything that we do. So it's always these little things in communication and between generations uh, that make a big difference. And hopefully we will debunk a few of those today. And then a majority of today will be up to you of asking me questions and what you want to learn. So um, there's several people watching right now live, and this will be up for a little bit for people to ask me questions. Um, again, uh, to the right-hand side, there will be uh, a chat. Please say something. Ask me any type of questions. I'll make sure to uh, answer those for you. I'm specifically doing this for District 58. So it's your time and opportunity to ask me questions. Uh, anything that uh, you can you want to ask me, I'm, I'm here for you for these next uh, 30 minutes to an hour uh, of our talk. So the first thing that I want to share with you is I want to share with you uh, my, my new book. It's called Motivating Millennials, and I want to share with you the thesis of it uh, so you can understand. It's First off, it's not an oxymoron. You can really motivate us. Uh, you got to know how to motivate us. So what I want to do is I want to explain the thesis of this book for you, uh, the synopsis of it, and then share with you why uh, some people might say things about millennials and why we are the way that we are. So my personal belief is that whatever happens in the home gets translated into the professional world. So whatever is happening in the uh, dining room uh, gets translated into the conference room. So what I'd like you to do um, is I want to explain the difference real quick between what I call baby boomers, well, what everyone calls baby boomers, and millennials. And um, I call them triangles and circles. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to draw a triangle on your piece of paper and a circle on your piece of paper. Now, millennials, uh, we were born anywhere from 19, oh, I'll pull it up a little bit. 
We were born anywhere from 1980 to 2000. And baby boomers, you were born a long time ago. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, you were born anywhere between 1964 and 1944. Uh, so Gen Xers, I'll get to you in a minute. Um, however, what I want to do is explain the difference between these triangles and these circles. So uh, baby boomers, whoever, if you're a baby boomer on this uh, live stream right now, um, you know what the definition of hard work is, right? You know what hard, what it means to work hard. You, uh, you paid for your own college. Uh, if you went to college, you bought your own car. I mean, you worked your butt off, right? So some words that come up that I hear often when you think of uh, millennials are things like maybe entitled or lazy or instant gratification. Um, first, I want to share with you baby boomers on the call. Uh, oh, Kim said she missed the millennials. I'm explaining right now. So it's uh, triangles, baby boomers, millennials, circles. Baby boomers, you worked hard, right? So in your house, you were raised in a triangular family, meaning you saw mom and pop at the top and then everybody else down below. So mom and pop were at the top of the empire in your house. And then everybody was down below. It was mom and pop, it was grandpa and grandma, it was uncles, it was the farm animals, and then it was you kids down below, right? And you saw over time, and eventually, if you worked hard enough, you too could get to the top of your pyramid. Well, that's how you worked for business as well. You wanted to create your own empire. So baby boomers, what I wanna ask you is, you know, you had us as kids. And when we were your children, did we buy our own cars? No. Did we pay for our own college? No. Who did? You did. Uh, so why are we the way that we are? Uh, because of you, baby boomers. You made us the way that we are. So there's a few differences between triangles and circles. Um, so what happened is when, you ha when we had family dinner, we sat around the dinner table with everyone. And since day one, we have felt like we have been part of the team. You have asked us questions. Uh, you have asked for advice from us. Could you imagine your parents, baby boomers, asking you for advice or asking you questions? So since day one, we felt like we have contributed to the table, to, uh, to the group, to the family. And so this is our belief this is our life of how we uh, want business to be too. Well, what happens is there are a lot of businesses, there are a lot of organizations, there are a lot of triangular structures within that. And so that's where the conflicting issues are happening because baby boomers wanted to build an empire, millennials want to build a community. Uh, baby boomers, when they were talked to, they were demanded things to do, right? Your parents said, do this or else. Uh, with millennials, we were explained things. So it said, hey babe, can you please do this because, hey, I'll give you an allowance. So what's happening is you need to get rid of this triangular viewpoint and you need to move over to circular to make sure that we are communicating to millennials in the right way. Now Gen Xers, you are squares. And the reason why you're squares is because you actually have the edges of a triangle, but the circular form of millennials, you're spot right in the middle, right? So uh, you still had family dinner. Uh, however, you always had assigned seats, didn't you? Mom always sat here, dad always sat here. You never sat in dad's chair. Now, why all three of these are important, why the triangular, the square, and the circle are important is because triangles have the knowledge uh, the squares have the understanding of being in the middle. Uh, I might have said some things and explained some things, and Gen Xers, you might have thought, well, I feel both. I want to create an empire and build a community. Uh, I'm okay when people demand things of me and explain things to me. So there's that understanding there that you are the person who can bridge that gap, and millennials were the ones who have the energy, have the uh, the opportunity for us to grow and to work and help our organization. So that's the difference between motivating millennials, in my opinion, from triangles, squares, and circles. And you gotta ask yourself, is your club, is your group, is your organization, is your company, is it circular? So what I wanna do now is I wanna open up a few questions uh, before we move on to another thing that I wanna share with you. And any questions around public speaking, 
around communication, around storytelling or the public speaking business, you can type in the chat box and I will answer any questions that you have specifically that I can help with. So I'll take some questions in the chat box and then we can go from there. So one, hold on, oh, sorry. So one thing that people are wanting to know is what are you wanting to do? How do you start uh, your public speaking business? So this is a good question, uh, comes up a lot. I, I say what you need to do is what's called your apps, your APS, your apps. You need to know your apps before you can really grow in the public speaking world. So app stands for what's your audience, what is the problem, and what is the unique solution to that problem. So app stands for audience, problem, solution. So within public speaking, who is your specific audience? You can't say men, you can't say women, you can't say students. You gotta get real specific. Um, problem. What problem do they face on a regular basis that is worth solving? Now that's a good question that you need to ask yourself because some problems they don't solve and so they've got to ask you got to ask what's the problem worth solving? And then what's your unique solution to that problem? So one of my apps that I use to get started within this business is I worked with high level executives. So you had to have C in your title. Um, it wasn't VPs, it wasn't directors, it was the COOs, the CEOs, the CMOs. I worked with high level executives. The problem is they needed to deliver high pre stake presentations and they didn't know how. So the problem was um, they got a, a million dollar proposal on the line or they've got this board presentation where they need to rock it and do a great job but they don't know the ins and outs of how to present. And then I have a solution unique to me called the LAP storytelling model, LAP, that I go in and teach these high level executives how to win high stake presentations. So that's one of my apps that I use. Start with one, don't have three at the beginning. I have about four now, however, that came from me using one and then building off of the other and the other. So find your apps and that will help start with the public speaking business. Uh, I got a question here, how do you deal with millennials at work, you being a boss? Great question. Um, first, it's important to understand where millennials are coming from, so understanding the, the triangle and the circle aspect. So when you're saying dealing with millennials at work, you being a boss, one of the things that's important to understand is with baby boomers, their incentives were generalized. And millennials, what we want are customized incentives. So we want them to be individualized for us. So when we feel like we are getting something that benefits us specifically, we are more willing to be motivated we're more willing to work harder for you, and we have more fun. And this is an example. Um, you know, like when my dad was in sales, um, everybody on the sales team would get a hundred dollar gift card, uh, whoever reached X amount for that month, right? So that was generalized. Well, instead of doing that, what you could do is customize your giveaways or things or incentives for millennials. For example, I do Ironman races, so you would pay for one of my races um, if I reached an X amount of goal. Um, Betty, who is in uh, marketing next to me, she might love to volunteer. So if she reaches her goal, you give her the day off and without, uh, I mean, with pay and without taking away from her two weeks vacation and give her time to volunteer to the organization she cares about. So a way that you can work with millennials at work and then you being the boss is incentivize them in a way that's custom to each individual. I hope that answers your question. Uh, any other questions related to millennials? Any other questions related to uh, public speaking or storytelling, you can write in the comments to the side there um, on YouTube. The next thing that I wanna share with you is uh, the, the real basis of what this live stream is all about. And it's the concept that I've been teaching lately that I'm really passionate about. And it's the difference between what it means to be a leader versus the leader. So no longer be a anything. Don't be a speaker, be the speaker. 
don't be a mom, be the mom. Have the mentality of going from A to V. Now, one of the things that you can do when you're A leader versus the leader differences, when A leader talks, people pay attention. When the leader talks, people take action. Big difference. So when you're talking, uh, are people paying attention to you because you have a leadership title in front of or behind your name, uh, or you've already set up the meeting? Or are they taking action? Are they volunteering? Are they saying yes? Are they buying from you? Be the leader in your industry. Another difference between a leader and the leader is a leader will get ready. The leader will stay ready. Very big difference. So a leader will get ready. The leader will stay ready. Now there is going to be a time and an opportunity when you get asked to be called on, whether that's with a TV camera in front of your face, whether that is you uh, being called on to speak at an industry conference. And what we don't want when we're the leader is to have situations where we go, um, well, I guess I could do that. We want to say, absolutely. So one of the rules that I implement is I call it the four, three, two, one, four, three, two, one. I'll repeat that. It's called four, three, two, one. And what you want to have at all times with you is you want to have four stories. You want to have three facts, two quotes, and one question. Now I'm going to explain this a little bit more and go into more detail, but you want to have four stories, three facts, two quotes, and one question with you at all time. Now for me, the four stories I believe you need to have are a personal and professional success and failure story. So you need to have a personal success story and a personal failure story. You need to have a professional success story and a professional failure story. Now here's the kicker about storytelling. You can never tell a story that does not add value. Okay, so you should always be adding value no matter what it is that you're giving. So making sure you're adding that value all the time with those stories. Now the three facts and the two quotes should be about your industry. So whether you are industrial or engineering or law firm or a speaker like me, those facts and quotes should be related to your industry, right? So one of my quotes is you don't have to be great to start, but you, you have to, sorry, <laughs> it's from Jim Rohn. You don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. Jim Rohn is in my industry. He's a public speaker. I can use that quote whenever I'm communicating. Um, a fact that I use is by 2025, 75% of the workforce is going to be millennial. So that's according to uh, New York Times. So having that will help boost your credibility and your confidence, which is really important to have. And then the question is, what's the one question that you have in your back pocket at all time in case you need to ask someone a question? So whether that, my, my question is, what do you wish you know, what do you know now that you wish you would have known when you were 29? Um, so that helps me out a lot, gets a good conversation started. That's my question that I ask anyone and everyone that I meet with. So what is your four, what is your three, what is your two, and what is your one, and have those ready. So you're not getting ready and being a leader, you're staying ready and being the leader. Um, so what I wanted to do with this uh, live stream, this was really for y'all. It was really for you in the sense of asking me questions. So I budgeted like 15 minutes to an hour for you today of anywhere in between to make sure that the people who were watching really got the value that they wanted out of it. So right now, I will still open up uh, the chat box to more questions. Uh, post your questions in the chat box. I will answer these questions. And then if there aren't any, um, what I'll do is I'll explain one more thing to you and then uh, we'll have a shorter seminar. Um, if not, and I'll get some more questions, um, then I will answer those and make sure that everybody gets what they need. Uh, within this you know, 30 minutes that we've been talking, uh, or 15, 15 minutes, 30 minutes that we've been talking, we've already learned the four, three, two, one. 
We've already learned the difference between what it means to be a leader and the leader and making sure we're paying attention to the. And we really understood the generational shapes of the triangles, the squares, and the circles and how we need to move over into that circular world. So are there any other questions that you have for me um, while I'm here that I can answer around storytelling, around communication, around uh, my workout routine? No, I'm kidding. Uh, anything and everything that I can do to help you, I would love. So how do you get ready for a, a meeting? Um, that's a good question. One of the things that I do is I do what's called GCA. So I Google, I call, and I ask before I meet with anyone. So I GCA it. So I Google, I call, and I ask. So before I'm selling a keynote or training, before I'm meeting with a meeting planner, I Google them, I call somebody in with, who knows them, or I ask people about them or the organization. Now why this is ready, important, because it goes back to A and B, right? A leader will get ready, the leader will stay ready. And I would say nine out of 10 times, whenever I do this, it benefits me tenfold. A um, Couple examples where I've used it. Uh, I have used it where uh, I first started out with special, when I used to work at Special Olympics. I, uh, I, I Googled the CEO, she didn't have a lot on Facebook or, or, or Twitter, um, so I called. And I, I called the, her assistant and I asked her, you know, certain questions like, what is she into? What does she like? Which kind of food? What's her favorite color? And her favorite color is purple. And she loved purple, the CEO. So what color shirt did I wear to that, uh, <laughs> to that interview? I wore purple. Uh, so be strategic in the way that you communicate. I used this last week. Um, I Googled the CEO who I'm working with and he's a big Timbers fan. I found on his Twitter account. Now, I'm not a big sports guy uh, at all, but what I did is when we talked, the very first thing that I said is, hey, I looked you up on Twitter and saw that you're a, um, <laughs> a Timbers fan. I used to live in Portland. Why are you a big fan of Timbers? And we started the conversation. And it really helped us connect, and it really helped us get there. And the reason why GCA is important is because it's important to understand that you need to humanize yourself before you professionalize yourself. So GCAing it before you go and meet with anyone is really important. Okay, got a lot more questions here. Um, Kim, how do you maintain work-life balance? Really good question. So I use this thing, Kim, called P3 times a day. P3 times a day. I know some of you are like, Ryan, that's too personal, or Ryan, I do that way more uh, than three times a day. But how I balance my work-life balance is I pee three times a day, and those three P's are, I break up my to-do list, here I can show you. I break up my to-do list in three categories, three P's, and those three P's are personal, professional, and partnerships. So personal, professional, and partnerships. Now you're, let's see if I can, so you're not seeing, uh, my full to-do list because I've done them all today as I'm at the end. The last thing I've got to do is lay out the A to B uh, workbook. Uh, under professional today was, you know, talking to D58. It was having my three interviews for my book. Uh, personal was reading uh, The Art of Joy. Uh, personal was working out and I already erased those. So I have a motto um, in my life. It's have fun, help others. That's how I live every day. So uh, Kim, what I would recommend is having a life motto uh, that makes you feel good. For me, it's have fun, help others, let it be under five words, and then break your to-do list down into these three categories. What I found is when we create to-do lists, a lot of the times either they're too professional or they're too personal or you're hanging out with people way too long. So what this does is it allows me to identify okay, I have a good balance of me time, I have a good balance professionally, and I have a good uh, balance with uh, people that I, I talk with and who I'm friends with and family with. And that's how I break up my day. I do my personal things in the day, my professional things uh, throughout the afternoon and throughout the morning. And then at the end, I do my partnerships. I call my parents, uh, hang out with my wife and, and daughter and those things like that. So that's how I manage work-life balance. Uh, Betsy would like to know if you spoke professionally before you won the World Championship of Public Speaking. Great question. No, I did not. I uh, never gave a professional speech uh, until after the World Championship. Uh, after the World Championship, 
I woke up to 269 emails asking me to speak. And I remember the very first keynote that I gave, I was wigging out because, you know, it took me eight months to create a seven minute speech. And now they're asking me to give an hour speech. And I freaked out. Uh, I probably, looking back on it, did not do the best job for that company. And I feel kind of bad. Uh, but you got to jump in and learn as you go. I didn't even know this was a job. Um, I, my wife and I, we come from nonprofit backgrounds. Um, so she worked at Girls Inc. and I worked at Special Olympics. Now, you don't automatically, you know, make a ton of money and get all these gigs right after you win the world championship. Uh, you do in the sense of people want to invite you to places and you get to travel for free. And I remember making my first $200 and I was like, 200 bucks, what's up? And it was super exciting. Um, so you don't automatically make a living right after you win the world championship. Uh, and I, I remember Randy Harvey, my mentor, calling me, or I called him, and he said, get ready for the real work to begin if this is what you want to do. I was like, what do you mean? I've been working so hard already. He goes, you haven't been working hard at all if you're considering being a public speaker. And he was spot on. Like, I was working crazy hours to, to train for the world championship. And I would say I'm working even harder and longer now being a public speaker. So thanks for that question, Betsy. Uh, Diana wants to know, how do you select the topics of your books and speeches? This is a phenomenal question. Simple. I listen to the questions people ask me. So I'm going to repeat that. So how do I select the topics of my books and speeches? I listen to the questions people ask me. So right after I won, people were asking me all these questions about speaking. So that's what I did is um, Jeremy Donovan and I and my first book, Speaker Leader Champion, we put 92 tips in here of how to be uh, a better speaker at work. So that was the first book. Second book, I can't tell you how many questions I've got about being a millennial, communicating with millennials, talking to millennials, motivating millennials. So I realized, wow, a lot of people want this. A lot of people are asking me about it. So that's how I come up with my speeches. So start gathering these questions people are asking you and maybe it's not you maybe you might be a little introverted or you might not be getting asked questions so start listening to what questions people are asking on facebook on linkedin on twitter and see if you a want to answer them uh, and then b if you have the time and can take the time to answer them so that's literally what i do um, then my next book comes out in february next year motivating millennials and it's based off of from the questions people ask me. Uh, another question that I'm getting is, what technique do you use when uh, structuring your impromptu speech? Cool, love this. Uh, so impromptu speaking, I use an acronym. Um, it, it's called PARTS, P-A-R-T-S, PARTS, P-A-R-T-S. So PARTS of an impromptu speech. Um, I state the position is what it stands for. So you ask me a question and I either agree or disagree with it. So what's my position on it? Um, a stands for answer. Um, why? Why do you say that? Um, you know, why uh, is Superman better than Batman? So position. I believe Batman is better than Superman. Uh, answer, right, uh, is the answer tied into it. And then R stands for reasons. So what are some reasons behind that? Give one or two or three. Like, I think he has a cooler car. I think he um, is human and then he became super, which gives me hope. And because uh, I believe that I could one day be more like him versus Superman is unattainable. And then T is things others say. So bringing in what other people say builds up your credibility. So then I go into and I say, you know, um, Batman has, uh, has sold more products than Superman has. Uh, more kids dress up as Batman than Superman for Halloween every year. So therefore, I think I uh, am in the majority here. And then summary. S stands for summary. I summarize it up. So I believe that Batman is better than Superman because of the car he drives, the uh, human ability that he has to be super, and because other people think so too. So parts, P-A-R-T-S, uh, it, it works really well. That's how I do it in my head, and uh, I've used it for years, and it's helped me every time. So P-A-R-T-S, and I hope that helps you. Okay, uh, great questions. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Um, the last thing that I'm going to do is teach you a few more strategies and techniques, and then um, I'll end uh, here. Uh, first off, never, ever, ever end on a Q&A session. 
Okay, so always have something else that you can give, share, or teach. Uh, never end on a Q&A session. And the reason why is, is because it's our job as the leader and communicator to keep people focused and engaged. And when you say Q&A, people tend to check out and uh, it might not be the best. And what we want is people hooked because there are some good things that come from Q&A. I mean, how do you maintain work-life balance and how do you select topics and impromptu talking? Those are all great questions. And I would have hated if someone was watching right now and didn't get the answers to that. Now, there are about uh, 10 different things that make you a difference between A to V and leadership. Uh, I usually teach this in a day, so I'm giving you a few of them right now. Uh, and the one that's really important to me that I wanna share with you, uh, and one thing that I want you to think about moving forward, is a leader knows family is important. The leader shows family is important. Very big difference. So a leader knows family is important, the leader shows family is important. Very, very big difference. There are some of you who are watching right now who are working way too hard on your business or in your business or your company, um, and you're doing too many things for you or another company, and you're not doing enough for your family. And I, I wanna really encourage you to go, and this weekend or tonight, go and hug them, make them dinner, take them on a picnic, show them on a regular basis that you care about them and that you love them. Family is the most important thing and we need to remember that on a regular basis. Um, so the main message that I wanted to get across today to you was don't be a leader, be the leader and that ties into family as well. Don't be a mom, be the mom. Don't be a husband, be the husband. So really make sure you're going from A to V and you have that mindset of you're no longer gonna be A anything, you're gonna be V in something. Like I don't wake up in the morning thinking I wanna be a speaker. No, I am going out and say how can I be the speaker for this audience today. So have that mentality, keep going from A to V in your industry. Uh, and I look forward to hopefully being in person uh, soon, D58. I love it out there, uh, and I hope I can see you all soon. So thank you for having me. Thank you for doing this, and I look forward to staying in touch and being in person in D58 soon. So thank you all, and I will talk to you all soon. Have a good weekend, everybody. Bye.